Thank you and good morning. On behalf of all of us at the National Governors Association, a very warm welcome to all of you. We're so excited that so many people have joined us here this week. Since 1908, the National Governors Association has served as a bipartisan voice of the leaders of the 55 states, commonwealths, and territories. We are extremely pleased to be here with you in Portland, Maine for the 2022 annual summer meeting. And I'd like to thank Governor Janet Mills and leaders from the city of Portland for hosting us. I would also like to thank our NGA partners for your ongoing support and efforts to make this year's meeting a success. This has been a meeting that's been two years in the process and we're just so delighted to be here. We have a great program over the next two days and so to get us started, I'd like to first introduce our great host, the governor of the great state of Maine, Janet Mills. Well, thank you, Bill. And thank all of you for being here, being in Portland and being in Maine. You know this uh, meeting got postponed several times. And so after long awaiting this event, I'm pleased to welcome you all here to Portland and to Maine in general. As I explained last night at the dinner, Maine is actually about 3,500 miles of coastline. If you count all the funky peninsulas and the great places to explore, I hope you'll take some time after the plenary sessions, after the meetings, to enjoy Maine outside of Portland, as well as Casco Bay and its many, many islands. Our little state, jutting out of the northeast corner of our country with a population of only 1.3 million, with its secret waterfalls, its towering pines and spruce trees, its rolling hills and fields, its mighty rivers and bold coasts. This unique place that we call home offers so much to so many. The true soul of Maine, however, is its people. And for more than 200 years, sons and daughters of Maine with courage in their souls and kindness in their hearts, with steely grit and iron resolve and an unshakable independent spirit, have built this state and led the nation. They are people of all political parties, bound by the shared belief that their government should work for them. They include firefighters and teachers and nurses and hotel workers and farmers and fishermen, waiters and hairdressers, and people like Alain, who is only 19 years old and whose family came here from Burundi just a few years ago, and he is a rising star in our city and in our culture. Thank you, Alain, for your rendition of the national anthem, which I know you love as much as anybody. Thank you. We are people of all political parties here in Maine. That belief is in our blood and it is bred by generations of Maine leaders like Margaret Chase Smith, first woman to serve in both the House and the Senate of the Congress of the United States. Edmund S. Muskie, former US Senator and Secretary of State. Bill Cohen, George Mitchell, Olympia Snow, people who believed in putting their country before their political party. That belief is sometimes shaken by the partisanship that we read about and see in Washington. But this, in the state of Maine, we are proud that bipartisanship is possible, even now. Just this year, Democrats, Republicans, and independents in Maine enacted historic legislation that I was proud to sign into law. Bills that made public education more affordable at every level. Bills that protected our natural resources, that built safer roads and bridges, that increased tax relief, that expanded health care, and invested in child care and early childhood education. Almost 200 bills jointly, jointly sponsored by Democrats, Republicans, and independents that I was proud to sign into law. We accomplished this progress by having the courage to compromise, the strength to stay at the table, the wisdom to work with anyone who is willing to make a difference. And I know many of you have similar stories and similar voices in your own states. It's division and rancor that always makes the headlines. But hard work is what, making, is, what, is what is making life better for Maine people. 
I continue to strongly believe that while we will disagree on many issues, that we as a group have much more in common than what sets us apart. That there are opportunities for us to find common ground and consensus despite some disagreements. That is what governors have to do every day to improve the lives of our citizens. May we all find that common ground this week in Portland, Maine. From computer science education to the return of travel and tourism to youth mental health and maternal and infant health, this week's plenary sessions will offer an opportunity to all of us to share ideas, to problem solve, and to strengthen the relationships that we've forged these past few years. Thank you to the NGA for bringing us all together. And of course, the city of Portland has already welcomed you to eat at our world-renowned restaurants and stay in some of downtown's beautiful hotels overlooking our working waterfront. Let us all remember the beliefs that bind us together as governors and the great honor that we have to serve our beloved home states. And while in Portland, as a side note, while you'll find a lot of lovely dining rooms, ocean views, and floating restaurants with lobster, there's one special place that I'd invite you to patronize. It's called Wigon's Stationery Store. It's right down the block here on Free Street, if you can get through. And there, from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. every weekday, you will find Sally Wigon. Sally epitomizes the main work ethic. She has worked in that store, which her grandfather founded since she was 12 years old. The pandemic has been pretty hard on her business, with people now often working home from home remotely and no longer needing paper goods. She lives at the top of Munjoy Hill, about a mile from the shop. She no longer drives. She's 102 years old. And she would love to meet you and perhaps give you, give you a bit of living history of the city of Portland and buy a bit of stationery from her. Tell her Janet sent you. Have a great day. Welcome to Portland again. Welcome to Maine. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Mills. We really appreciate that. I'd now like to introduce our National Governors Association Chairman, Arkansas's Governor Asa Hutchinson. Asa Hutchinson became the 46th Governor of Arkansas in 2015. In 2018, he was reelected with the largest percentage of margin of victory in Arkansas history. Governor Hutchinson became Chairman of the National Governors Association in July of 2021 and he chose as his chair's initiative to highlight computer science education. And we could not be more pleased to be here today to celebrate the success of his initiative. From the early days of his professional career, Governor Hutchinson's work in Arkansas has caught the eye of national leaders. He was appointed the U.S. Attorney for the Western District of Arkansas. At the time, he was the youngest U.S. Attorney in the history of the, at the time in the nation. He was elected to the United States House of Representatives and re-elected twice. As a congressman, he advocated for uh, a crackdown on illegal drugs and served as manager of a presidential impeachment. And during his time in Congress, he was appointed to lead the Drug Enforcement Administration. And then shortly thereafter, we had the tragedy of the 9-11 attacks in 2001. Uh, President Bush then created the Department of Homeland Security, and he asked Asa Hutchinson to serve as the Undersecretary for Border and Transportation Security. But in his two terms as governor, he's cut taxes, raised pay for teachers, persuaded the General Assembly and voters to fund highway and road maintenance, and added unprecedented millions of dollars into strategic reserve and rainy day savings accounts, all while managing the state through historic floods, historic storms, all the things that governors deal with. This is the job that governors do. But then something happened in March of 2020. And you know, it was like three weeks after we had our winter meeting, and many of you were there, uh, this pandemic struck our country. And I just have to, to say, I want to tell you that I observed these governors work on that issue. And our nation's governors came together. And if it weren't for our nation's governor, I can stand here today and tell you, we wouldn't be sitting here today because the nation's governors managed this pandemic 
and the success we've had. We are so proud of them. But now that we're moving through that, they're getting back to their regular jobs. That they, it wasn't that they weren't doing them, but now they can really devote full time to what they were elected to do, and that's really to make their states great places to live. So on behalf of all of us here at the National Governors Association, thank you, Governor Hutchinson, for your leadership. You've just been a great chair, and we've appreciated everything you've done for us. So let's give a warm welcome to Governor Asa Hutchinson. Thank you, Bill. Uh, what a great morning. What an incredible crowd here. I want to extend greetings to uh, my fellow governors, uh, but also uh, for the spouses that are here. I know that they have a separate program, but they've joined us this morning. So would everybody give the spouses uh, a round of applause for their leadership and my First Lady, Susan Hutchinson. What an exceptional evening we had last night. It was a tremendous opportunity to exchange ideas, but also to have a little fun along the way. And Governor Mills, thank you for your comments today, but thank you for hosting us here in Maine. Let's give uh, Janet another round of applause. <laughs> and I recognized them last night, but I very much appreciate on behalf of the NGA, our international delegations that are here from the European Commission, Canada, United Kingdom, and other foreign dignitaries. If you're representing uh, in that category, please stand and let's recognize you. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. I've been asked about my year as chair of the National Governors Association. And the answer is that it has been one of the most rewarding times in my public career, and as Bill introduced me, I've had a number of different positions in my public career. Governors are problem solvers, and we get things done. That has been the emphasis of the NGA over the last year, whether it is fighting a pandemic, working on infrastructure issues, school safety, or education. We've worked together, we've made a difference in each of those areas. And a great deal of credit goes to the governors that serve uh, on the executive committee and our task force members that we will hear reports from later uh, during this conference. In this first session this morning, we are focused on my chair's initiative, which is K through 12 computer science education. And what we've been able to do on this initiative will make a difference for our nation now and in the years to come. Governors must lead on this. There is no alternative, and we have. And this initiative is about jobs that are needed right now in our country. More than 650,000 computing jobs are open nationwide. Those are good paying jobs with the average computer science major earning 40% more than the average college graduate. It is also about our future. Our future will be defined in our nation by our nation's character, but our progress as a society will be guided by advances in technology. We will deal with growing cybersecurity threats along with data protection and privacy concerns. This progress that we hope to make depends upon our leadership as governors to advance computer science education. In Arkansas, we have made giant leaps in computer science education, both in terms of access, quality of instruction, and student participation. When we started in 2015, we had 1,100 students in Arkansas taking computer science. Today, we have over 12,500. Girls and students of color are underrepresented in this field, but we are making progress. We have seen a 1,300% increase in the number of girls and a 700% increase in the number of African-American students enrolled in computer science courses. We did this by mandating by law that every high school in Arkansas offer 
computer science, and then we included that curriculum in the lower grades as well. Even more critical, we started with fewer than 20 computer science teachers, and today we have more than 600 certified computer science teachers in the state. To reach those numbers in certified teachers, we pay up to $10,000 over five years as a bonus to those teachers who become certified and teach in the classroom. Those numbers will continue to increase because Arkansas has now joined South Carolina, Nebraska, Tennessee, and Nevada to pass legislation making computer science a requirement to graduate from high school. And let me provide, and I know that's the Arkansas story, and each of you have your own state story as to how you have progressed and led in the area of computer science education. But all I can speak from is my experience and what I've learned as I've traveled across the country. But let me provide four keys from my experience that is important in promoting computer science education. First, it is important to have legislative support. Sometimes you can do this by executive action uh, through your Department of Education. But to have the law passed and the legislature engaged made a big difference in the public acceptance, the school acceptance of this initiative. Secondly, money speaks volumes. And putting money behind a computer science initiative gives it credibility, gives it strength, and gives you the flexibility to accomplish things. And so dedicated funding is critical. We started with $5 million of my discretionary funds and then we built it into the budget. Third, we need to have a state office for computer science education that leads the effort, that helps guide and make sure the local school districts are on track. And fourth, it is critical to have a governor's leadership. Your leadership provides visibility, focus and results and accountability to our local districts. And so those are four keys that I know our governors are trying to implement in the states, but has helped us to have success in Arkansas. And so how did we do this year in the CHAIRS initiative? Well, we have promoted our initiative through regional meetings in Denver, Bentonville, Boston, and Washington, D.C. These regional meetings allowed governors to share ideas, to partner with our industries, and to hear from students. In Boston, we focused on career pathways showcasing how we must meet the diverse needs of our workforce. We've developed a toolkit that is available on the NGA website. This toolkit is built around best practices that we've accumulated from different states and national partners, practical recommendations I hope you'll take advantage of. Well, that's a little bit of a summary of what we've done in part through this initiative. But before we move into the panel discussion, which I know you're anxious for, I wanted to recognize an individual who's made a difference in our state and for our national effort as well. This is Anthony Owen, Arkansas's own computer science czar. He came on board. <laughs> Anthony, come on up here. He came on board as our director of computer science at the very beginning, and he will be leaving in a few weeks for an opportunity to promote computer science education nationally. And so come on up here, Anthony. I wanted to uh, present to you just a token to show our appreciation to you. And let's give Anthony a round of applause. Thanks, Anthony. And now we have a, a short video to present, and I'll follow that by uh, presenting the compact uh, of the governors for computer science. We're laying the foundation for the next generation of problem solvers in our society. What motivates any governor in public service is doing better for the citizens of your state and the next generation and being a problem solver. So we had to overcome some skepticism about it early on. But I've had letter after letter that says, it's working, it's changing lives. Demand and in industry is there. Not every kid graduating will go to college, but every kid is entering a digital economy. 
One of the reasons this initiative is successful is because we have our private sector partners. And it's really helpful whenever those private sector partners come into the schools and showcase what a future can be like in technology. But what's really been rewarding to me is to see how the other governors have embraced it. We've laid the foundation. It's been embraced by educators and students alike. So it's gonna continue and the need will continue there. And for governors to be led like they're being led today on computer science and coding and STEM education for the future gives me a lot of encouragement as a grandfather that things are actually gonna get better and not worse. The students want this and educators respond to it. So all through this, success belongs to teachers that facilitate, that have the courage to go out there and embrace this computer science because the skills are so essential for the students of the future. Governors know how important it is to track data and to measure results. And so we started the idea of the Compact of Governors and this initiative, we wanted to uh, track our progress. And so we set a number of goals. One was to increase the number of high schools offering computer science classes, to increase the amount of state funding, to increase the number of states requiring at least one computer science class for a graduation, and to increase the diversity of students that take computer science. And so let's see how we have done on the progress of these five uh, efforts. And according to the yearly state of computer science education report between 2020 and 2021, the proportion of high schools offering computer science courses increased from 47% to 51%, which is a critical jump at a critical time. The number of states that allocate funding ticked up from 29 to 31, with 21 states allocating over $65 million for computer science education in fiscal year 2022. Two more states, Nebraska and Tennessee, joined Arkansas, Nevada, and South Carolina in requiring at least one computer science credit to graduate. And, la and last, but certainly not least, we're making significant headway in increasing the diversity of students. We've made progress with girls, uh, but also the latest numbers show 49% of elementary students and 44% of middle school students in computer science classes are female. That is real progress in bringing girls into coding. Every racial or ethnic demographic group have increased as well. And just if you look at the number of African American students that take it, it's gone from 66% to 73%. Latino students increased from 71% to 76%. The fifth goal, increasing the number of governors committed to, com to the compact, is important to reinforce each of these goals that I've mentioned. The states are doing an amazing job, and so I am pleased to announce today that 50 governors have signed the compact to advance computer science education in their states and territories. And there is the compact with the signatories. And let me tell you, this has exceeded every expectation I ever had. And I want to thank each of the governors for your support of this initiative, for your leadership in the states. It is important that we need, we build a national movement because computer science is a national security issue for us all. By signing this compact, the governors have committed to expanding access to K through 12 computer science education and depending upon the states, but that could include increasing the number of high schools offering computer science, allocating funding, creating pathways to post-secondary success and providing equitable access for all students. So thank you again to each of the governors. And so uh, I am grateful for this success and look forward to not this past year, but the future results that we can see and we can measure. And so with that, uh, let me move to the most important part of our discussion today, which is our panelists. And if our 
panelists would come on to the stage. I'll be introducing Dean Kamen and uh, Patrick Gelsinger. Welcome uh, our panelists. Uh, please have a seat. Appreciate Pat, Dean. I'm going to make my way over here. And uh, let me give a little bit more formal introduction, and we're going to have them uh, make some comments, and then we will, I'll have a few questions. We want to make sure we turn it open to uh, the governors uh, as well. And most of you are familiar with the accomplishments and contributions of each of the uh, panelists today, but let me talk about those. Uh, Dean Kamen, to my left, is an inventor an entrepreneur and a tireless advocate for science and technology. As an inventor, he holds more than 1,000 U.S. and foreign patents, many of them for innovative medical devices. He showed me one behind backstage. His innovations have driven critical advances in cancer care, diabetes treatment, prosthetics, and on and on. Somewhere along the way, he found time to invent the Segway as well. <laughs> In 1982, he founded DECA, a research and development corporation headquartered in New Hampshire. Uh, DECA is one of the leading research and development companies in the country. He's also founded FIRST, which he will talk about for inspiration and recognition of science and technology. He founded that in 1989. This year, FIRST will serve more than one million young people in more than 113 countries around the globe. So please welcome Dean. I'm also pleased to welcome Intel CEO Patrick Gelsinger. Uh, during his decades of innovation, Patrick has made pivotal contributions in countless computing technology advances, including microprocessors, USB, Wi-Fi, cloud computing, cybersecurity, and much more. Patrick joined Intel in 1979 as a technician, eventually earned eight patents, and became Intel's youngest vice president in 1992, and his first technology officer in 2001. After positions as CEO of VMware and President and Chief Operating Officer of EMC's Information Inf Infrastructure Products, Patrick returned to Intel as CEO in 2021. Since then, he's been on the national stage working to return to the United States leading a leading role in semiconductor production, working with Congress and the administration and I know he'll be addressing that and the global chip shortage that we've experienced. This is all in addition to numerous philanthropic efforts. So please join me in welcoming Patrick Gelsinger. And so with that, uh, Pat, why don't you start off, uh, give us your thoughts today, and we'll turn to Dean. Pat? Very good, thank you. And uh, uh, to uh, you know, Governor uh, uh, Mills, I do want to say I was talking uh, yesterday uh, to uh, Governor Brown in Oregon, and we had lived for 25 years in Oregon, and it reminded me the first time uh, my, my wife and I were going to go to the symphony in Portland. I got tickets. We were about to go downtown on the night of it. She's all dressed up and ready to go. I look at the tickets, Portland, Maine. Uh, uh. So. Maybe I can get a refund while I'm here. <laughs> right. But uh, you know, it really is a pleasure to be here. Some of you I've known for a number of years, and thank you, you know, for the uh, opportunity. And I just start by the question, what aspect of your life is not becoming more digital? Right? And the simple answer is every aspect of human existence is becoming more digital. And COVID has shown this to us in the most acute ways possible. Right? And we've seen the semiconductor shortages, you know, the need for online education, for remote uh, health care. You know, our social experiences have shifted. So literally everything is becoming more digital. And everything digital runs on semiconductors. Right? This has become more important to our future. And I'll say geopolitics have been defined for the last five decades by where the oil reserves are. 
where the fabrication facilities are, where the semiconductors, where the technology sources are, is more important for the next five decades. And as I like to say, let's build them where we want them. Uh, Intel, one of the largest R&D spenders on the planet uh, today, and uh, we are you know, extremely focused on education, technology initiatives, and we do see that uh, ensuring U.S. leadership, you know, and the two points would say, you know, what does it take to uh, build semiconductors? It takes talent and lots of capital, right? You know, for us to go uh, do that, and two topics that are critical for us today. We believe deeply that we have to ensure this future for our nation. It is that important, you know, for every aspect of our economy, every aspect of our national security, and we get to decide. You know, there was never a vote taken. In uh, 1990, U.S. produced almost 40% of the world's semiconductors. Today, that's 12% and declining, right? There was never a vote taken by any of you or by the uh, Senate or by you know, the House to get rid of this industry. But there were votes taken in China, Korea, Taiwan, that they want this industry. It's that important. And that's what brings us to the chip crisis that we're participating in today. So we need investment. We need uh, talent. You know, as we think about the talent aspects of it, you know, we're a company hugely focused on building that tech pipeline for the future. I personally am a participant. I touched my first computer when I was 16. You know, I'm a farm kid from Pennsylvania. I have no business to be running a Fortune 50 company. You know, I, should, I knew more about com uh, cow chips than computer chips. <laughs> and now I lead one of the most iconic companies uh, in America in that respect. I started as a technician uh, at the company. I came through community college and uh, tech school before going on to Santa Clara, Stanford, uh, and uh, graduate work. You know, the power of our community college systems is extraordinary. But we've seen also that, and you know, I love your comments, uh, you know, Governor, right? You know, and in the past it was read, write, and arithmetic. Now it's read, write, code, and arithmetic as we think about the future. It is, you know, who cares if you can use a, you know, a pencil? I just know if you can uh, write code, right? How's your Python skills, right? You know, that becomes more important to our future. You know, we also see that this technology, you know, that we're in right now, and uh, there's a bill in front of Congress right now called the CHIPS Act. And this CHIPS Act, right, is a critical piece of legislation to turn the tide of our declining manufacturing industry on semiconductors. I have a request for each of the governors here that you reach out to your senators, to your caucuses right now, and say that they do not get to go home for August recess until this bill gets finished. Right? You know, we've, uh, you know, it passed the Senate over a year ago. And we've languished in political uh, quagmire to see it come across the line. It is critical that it's get done. When I became CEO at Intel, I went in front of Wall Street and I said, first thing, I've stopped buybacks. Second, I'm taking my free cash flow negative for the first time in over three decades. I have more than tripled the capital outlays as we're building manufacturing uh, facilities. And with that, we've put us, our chips on the table with the presumption that Congress has finished its job and allow us and make these incentive investments to have our industry be competitive back on US. It's been over a year at this point, and I have to make decisions very quickly whether we're gonna continue with the plans that we've laid out in Arizona and in Ohio to move uh, forward. And for that, you know, we're you know, at a critical point of time. Don't go home to August recess without this being finished. When we announced the Silicon Heartland in Ohio, it was an extraordinary moment, right? The nation was thrilled because the tech boom affected the coasts, not the center of the nation, right? And bringing manufacturing back to the center of the nation with, you know, as, as we said when we announced the site with uh, Governor DeWine, it was today ends the Rust Belt and today begins the Silicon Heartland. You know, a, a moving moment uh, for the nation and one that we're excited to see come to fruition. On our education initiatives, we also announced a $100 million commitment to technology, uh, invest in technology education investments uh, this uh, decade. And with that, uh, we have 
uh, you know, seminal programs uh, like uh, AI workshops and uh, AI training and AI for youth. We've also set a goal of a hundred million girls right, that would be uh, taught in our training, or a million girls, not a hundred million, a million girls uh, initiative that we've set uh, to participate. I'd also challenge that we think about one change to our thinking on uh, STEM education, that to be more diverse and inclusive, STEM becomes STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And with that, to be much more embracive of many of the other skill sets around it. And STEAM education is far more attractive, particularly for women who you know, aren't typically as appropriate to or, or pursued into the hard sciences field. So with that, we would say we are committed. We've put our chips on the table. You know, we need investments and we need talent to enable what we believe is the most critical thing, more important than any other aspect of our, uh, of our nation's future. Where is our technology future? Where are we building our manufacturing? These are great jobs. We need talent for the future. We've put our chips on the table. We look forward to you joining us and making this come true for our great nation. Thank you. Thank you, Pat, and I know uh, you made a special effort to be here, take it a red eye, and you'll be going back. Uh, yeah, I got my board dinner tonight, so uh, anyway, so I hope I'm awake for my own board dinner, so. Uh, well, we're very grateful for that. You're on a, the forefront of one of the most important battles that we face in our nation, which is bringing chip manufacturing back. So the Governor Association wants to be supportive, has been supportive of that. Uh, I also, uh, let me turn it over to Dean now who uh, took a red eye from uh, New Hampshire over here. Glad you made it, Dean. <laughs> but we welcome your comments. Thank you. And I'll start by telling all of you governors, he gave you an easy one, just prevail upon senators and their advisors to go do something. I'm gonna give you a, maybe a heavier lift, but hopefully a more fun one. My homework to you guys as leaders, as CEOs, is to deliver something that I hope you'll be compelled to agree uh, is necessary. Um, I started first as a not-for-profit 501c3 more than 30 years ago. The name itself, the acronym, FIRST, for inspiration and recognition of science and technology, conspicuously does not have the word education in it. Um, I'm an inventor. What do inventors do? Inventors look at the same problems as everybody else and see them differently. My mom was a teacher until about a year ago at 94. Mm. My dad's an artist, by the way, the first art director among Shock, Horace Spence, and Mad Magazine. I am Alfred E. Newman. Um, <laughs> I was four years old when he did it. But I would, I would tell you that I started this not-for-profit because I, like everybody, had a great teacher, everybody here that wants to gripe about the education crisis and blame everybody for everything. Somehow everybody knows they have great teachers. And if you look at just statistics, the United States spends more money per capita on education than any country in the world. So why was it that 30 years ago we had so few girls studying math, science? Why did we have almost no African Americans and Hispanics doing this? Everybody decided to solve the problem. It's an education problem. First of all, if they're right, they don't need me. You're spending billions, hundreds of billions on that. As an inventor, I looked at that problem and said, you've misdiagnosed the entire situation. The problem this country has is not lack of supply, it's lack of demand. And what happened is, post-World War II, we've created industries. You know, some of you have heard of the NBA, the NFL, uh, the World Series, the Super Bowl. This country is obsessed with sports and you've heard of Hollywood. So it's, it's the late 1980s and I said, you know, in a free country where you get what you celebrate, what we're missing in this country is a way to celebrate science and technology. In fact, we worse than don't celebrate it. We convinced girls it's not for you. It was literally culturally, girls had to hide it if they liked it. Um, and African American kids, every role model they could see, it's pretty much still true, is in the NBA, the NFL, or Hollywood. The world of entertainment and the world of sports has no shortages of cross-sectional diverse superstars. The world of tech can't say that. 6% of all the practicing engineers are African American. Why is that? It's a culture issue. So once I decided that's the problem, I thought it would be easy to fix. It would take a year and I'd move on. 
I said, we know a model that works, sports. Let's create a sport around science and engineering. And I don't mean let's make a science fair masquerading as a sport. It's a sport. It's after school, it's aspirational. You don't get quizzes and tests. You get letters and trophies. And anybody that's been to a first event would see. It's as exciting as any other sport. So I started it, but I said, our sport, like every other sport in this country, needs superstars. We don't play cricket in this country, and it's not because there's a critical cricket shortage in our curriculums. We don't play cricket because there's no NBA or NFL that's good. So I said, I'll go to the big companies I knew back then, and I owned in a little helicopter company. I was manufacturing them, so I knew the aerospace giants. I built a lot of stuff in the medical company. I knew the CEOs of the big medical companies. I was lucky enough to have moved to a little state called New Hampshire where you could call the governor and say, help me. It was Chris Sununu's dad, John Sununu at the time. Um, and I said, let's, let's model a game, we'll put it, and we'll get leaders from industry to supply us mentors. We'll not ask, the teachers, the gym teacher isn't the one that makes kids want to play football four hours a day every day after school. And math, they take pass fail. Physics, they don't take it all. Then we wonder why we have great football players and no employees. And I was predicting back then this country's going to lose its edge. We're going to have all the problems we have now. The equity disparity is going to get worse and worse with the kids with the power of tech. And by the way, great that you supplied more supply, but the unintended consequence will be if we don't get girls and minorities to buy into this, you're going to create an even bigger gap between the haves and the have-nots. So there's a lot of places in this country, a lot of people, a lot of organizations that are creating supply. There's no organized method of creating demand among all kids, particularly kids whose parents might not be professional, to say developing that muscle hanging between your ears is just as exciting as any other, except we have the only sport where every kid on every team can turn pro. There aren't a few hundred thousand jobs right now in the NBA, the NFL, or at Hollywood. There's a few million jobs, not jobs, but careers for kids that know how to think. So I started it. And it was grassroots. I had 23 companies. I invited them all from across the country. First year, I think we had Intel. We had Boeing. Around the country, they came to a high school gym. The next year, we had 40 teams. The next year, 100. The next year, 200. The next year, 500. By the way, governors, your CEOs, for 31 years, we've had 55% compound annual growth. This year, 81,000 schools, 200,000 volunteer mentors. We gave out $80 million in scholarships to these kids at our championship, which was 55,000 kids in, in Houston at the Astrodome. We're giving 50% of these kids are from Title I schools. Over 30% of the kids on these teams are girls. About 20% of the teams, the girls are now the captains because these kids have figured out girls are better at organizing and communicating and cooperating. That should teach you guys something. But in any event, uh, it worked, and we got really big. And by the way, by the end of our fifth year, I couldn't bring them all to New Hampshire. Here's where your homework starts coming in. By the fifth year, I said, we got to start putting regional events throughout March, March Madness. Every state ought to have a championship, and every state could do local events with their local sponsors and their local mentors. It'll cut the cost of our sport way down, because they don't have to get on airplanes. They don't have to stay in hotels. And so we started doing that. By the way, I, I did put in front of every one of you this year's little schedule of events. If you open it up, you'll see our season ended with 182 cities. There isn't anybody out there that doesn't have a championship in your state. And most of you have hundreds of teams in your state. But here's the rub, governors. It's a not-for-profit. It doesn't have the media attention of ESPN. We're competing with entrenched organizations that have no trouble funding the football team and the basketball team, which are not only not likely to lead to careers, but let's be honest, they're fun, but they're a distraction from education. You need to have a, 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 a sport in a school that develops the same passion among these kids as these other sports, and trust me, that will be a cultural shift that will create a whole new dynamic and a whole new workforce, which he desperately needs. My little company with 900 engineers has 100 open positions. So my request of all of you is we've been doing this grassroots. We've been growing because every school that gets involved picks another school to help them. But we've never gotten to scale because we're not standardized. If you asked every school in this country, kids need to learn to do exercise. But every school has to create its own sport. 
build its own fields, create its own, it wouldn't happen. And then you couldn't compete with each other, they couldn't cooperate, you couldn't make superstars. And in our culture, which is driven by, as I said, you get the best of what you celebrate, why don't we start celebrating the best of the things we desperately need? That will cause people to go into the programs you're putting in. That will cause all these things to happen. But the only way to do that is have leadership. You know, there's that, that, that phrase, individuals create, institutions sustain. Governors, you'll all be out of office one of these days. You're individuals. You've got to create something. Football's here. Basketball's here. If you want to have a lasting legacy, if you could leave office saying, our state now competes with all these other states in something as exciting, as fun, you'll want to go to the championship, I invite you all to the championship. If you guys can get involved in making this happen, it might be the biggest legacy for this country and its cultural shift that's got to be returned to something that's real. And by the way, among you, I see Governor Baker, Governor Burgum, our Governor Sununu, ask them, they've been to events, maybe some of you others have been to events in your state, ask these governors, and by the way, what does it cost to put a first team in? We don't need a football field. We don't need a parquet basketball court. You give the teacher in the school the same stipend for the after school season as you give the football coach, it's a few thousand dollars. You get them the kit, it's a few thousand dollars. The heavy lifting is the superstars that have to energize these kids. We deliver all of them. 200,000 volunteer mentors we had this year. There's still a staff now after 30 years of only 200 people. That says this little not-for-profit headquartered in Manchester, for every one of its staff people, has 1,000 volunteers. We have a new president, Chris Moore, here. And to prove we're committed to the sports model, we just brought him in. In his last job, he was running the largest youth organization, sports organization in this country, soccer. And we said, Chris, you got to get us into every school that's got a soccer team. It shouldn't be hard. It's the lowest cost. It's the best return. The problem is it takes leadership. You got to put it in there, and then it'll, it'll stay with us. So my homework, or I'll grovel, I'll beg, I'll do whatever it takes. Governors, it isn't going to be very hard. Is it a line item in your budget to say every school gets 10 grand, which is less than half of what you pay per student per year? And if you look at the dropout rate in the 20 largest school districts in the United States, if you used as the denominator for what your education budget is, the ones that actually graduate, not the total students, what you're paying for stu per student is a multiple of what it will cost you to put a first team in your school. It self-selects to the kids, to the girls, to the ones that might not otherwise think about it. And if you do it, we have data. The Ford Foundation spent a few million dollars uh, asking a major university to do a longitudinal study of the impact of FIRST on the schools we're in. And they came back and told us, and you can read the study. I'll send it to everyone here. They said FIRST had the largest single impact on kids that they'd ever seen in any study they had ever done. It's fun. It's exciting. It's a sport. Ask the governors. Ask our governor. Ask. Governor Baker asked, the problem we have is we're grassroots. It's time to go big scale. It should be done. We should make a standard sport. You guys could agree to do it. The same ones that signed your, your consort there, if they said, great, now that we've got a supply to create passion and demand, let each one of those same schools have a first team. That's all I ask. Dean, you make a rather strong pitch. <laughs> Well said, well said. Uh, the First Lady's jumping up and down over there. <laughs> Let me, uh, <laughs> uh, I have some questions here, but I would really like to turn it open to the governors. Uh, we've got some uh, really great presentations that have been made, and so uh, let's see if the governors have uh, any questions or uh, comments that you want to raise. Governor Yonkin. Um, I just want to say thank you to all three of you, but first, uh, Governor Hutchinson, thank you for your leadership. Uh, and it takes uh, a real leader to make things move, and things have moved, and so thank you. Uh, I, I have to say that um, the, the description around FIRST is extraordinary, uh, and just this week we signed a bill in Virginia that the first team that won the Virginia championship actually sponsored in our legislature. Uh, and so they're doing more than just winning competitions, they're changing government. Uh, and so thank you. 
And uh, yeah. And, and Pat, thank you for your leadership and thank you for caring about the future of America. Uh, it's you, just man. hugely important. Um, I, I think we all recognize that it's vital to support computer science in K through 12. And in fact, the recognition that we have so many jobs that are unfilled is a moment for us to catch our breath and say, what have we been doing? Because we've been running behind. I mean, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, we have nearly 33,000 computer science jobs that are unfilled. And the expectation is that there's gonna be 670,000 computer jobs, or computer science jobs, technology jobs, cybersecurity jobs created over the course of the next many years. And those are jobs I want Virginia kids to take. And as much as I love all the other states, I'd much rather have Virginia kids take them than, this, than uh, the North Carolina and Maryland kids. Uh, so as much as I love you guys. Um, so this is a moment for us to just recognize that what we've been doing when we have industry running so far ahead of the production is a big wake up call. And uh, Governor, thank you for answering the wake up call. Um, Virginia started uh, in 2017 actually being the first state to prioritize computer science. And in fact, we adopted computer science standards in 2017 and then, and then the administration went to sleep and we fell behind. We're still really good, but it frustrates me to hear other states that are doing things that we're not. And, uh, and so I guess today's my day to commit to actually be the best. And I think that's what we all have to do as governors. And so there's more that we can even do. Um, we've started because we gotta feed this demand equation, um, which is just insatiable and exciting. The best jobs with tremendous opportunities and career paths. In fact, they're not jobs, they're careers. And so we started this year with uh, a, a budget amendment for $100 million to fund lab schools in Virginia. And as part of that, a network of computer science schools uh, that will in fact be based on an existing model that works. And we have a school called Code RVA. And Code RVA is in the public school system. It's attracted kids from 15 school divisions, so you just sign up and go. You don't have to take a test, you just go. And it's now in a lottery system because there are so many kids who wanna go. But a third of the kids, a third of the kids who go to Car Code RVA Regional High School graduate with a, an associate's degree when they get out of high school. I mean, this is pretty exciting about the world of computer science. Um, we're doubling down on work-based learning, apprenticeships, apprenticeships, internships, work-study programs. This is critical, dual enrollment in our community college system. Uh, and then finally, we are partnering with employers. And I think one of the things that I'm most aware of is the fact that we're running behind we're running behind where the state of technology is. And so we're trying to bring in as many partners as we can into this. And we've had great ones. Gosh, we've got Amazon, we've got Microsoft, we've got Google uh, in Virginia, all participating in our education, funding a network of computer science schools is what Google has agreed to do. Thank you, Google. Helping us with our talent tech innovative partnership is what Amazon is doing and helping us aspire to graduate 15,000 more master's degrees in computer science, computer engineering, 16,000 more bachelor degrees. Um, and the great work that Microsoft is doing in our rural communities to actually launch new schools that provide an opportunity for our kids who may not otherwise have it to chase jobs of the future. That's why I appreciate this group. I will tell you all, I'm a new governor. And so thank you for allowing a new governor to learn from all of you um, because that's what it takes. Um, I have a question, and the question is this. <laughs> I know, I hate them. So I have a question, which is, it is this lag period. In Virginia, we have a seven-year curriculum uh, reevaluation. And in seven years, the world of what is state-of-the-art in computer technology and computer science will change fundamentally. And what are you seeing great states do in order to keep curriculum and to keep skill building at pace with industry? Uh, we got uh, both to answer this. Uh, Patrick, uh, Pat, why don't you start? Because uh, that's actually a, a great question. And I would just specifically add about uh, artificial intelligence and how do we yeah. adjust. So go ahead. 
Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and I tell you, you know, one of the things is, you know, here it's just you you always want your programs because the field moves on so rapidly to be, you know, shooting ahead of the duck. And right now, you know, our uh, AI for Youth program is probably the best in the uh, the best in the nation today, right? And I was just, uh, you know, giving out the awards for the. AI recipients globally and nationally uh, as well. You know, and here's a 16 year old kid describing to me how he's created the program to do crop detection, right? You know, from satellite images using AI programs. At 16 years old, right? I was blown away. Another one was describing how they were doing health detection, you know, for his, uh, for her mother uh, in this case, you know, being able to essentially diagnose her medical condition, right, you know, decades before the doctors could using AI techniques. So, you know, right now it's about shooting ahead of the duck, AI, you know, an AI program. And by the way, this is just fun when you start to look at some of the programs that they're now able to do, the programming models that they're able to do. You know, I'd also say to the, at the state level, you know, it's also about re-education. Right, you know, it used to be you took one education and you began a 30-year career. Now you have a 40-year right career span and a 10-year career span. Right, and it's all about re-education as well. So it isn't just about the K through 12, but how do those continue to come back into the education programs? And you know, that's where you know businesses like ours, et cetera, are increasingly investing. How do we partner with the educational systems to have those ongoing programs because the career spans are shrinking so rapidly? Dean. So <clears throat> I wish I was taking notes. <clears throat> Every one of the companies you mentioned in order, Mike and Jackie Bezos, Jeff's mom and dad are Amazon on the board. Yesterday I got an email, email from Satya Nadella who wants to up what Microsoft is doing with us. Larry and Sergey, the founders of uh, Google, every year make personal commitments as well as Google hosts entire uh, 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 regional events for us. I, when I mentioned 200,000 volunteer, all these tech, I forgot to mention we have 3,700 corporate sponsors. And then you talk about how do you get these kids more capable more quickly, and you talked about internships. One of the reasons I have all the sponsors isn't I'm a lovable guy, I'm a pushy, obnoxious guy, but those companies really? get access to these kids, and they don't let them go. They're taking high school kids in as interns. So everything you're talking about is what FIRST is doing. And then you ask, how are you going to fix education if it needs a fix over seven years? That's an insurmountable problem for lots and lots of reasons. You're still buying textbooks that cost two or three hundred bucks a piece. They're obsolete by the time you get them. You could give these kids an iPad and they have real-time updates in their curriculum every seven ma microseconds. Don't think about that as the solution to your problem. Solve a simpler one. Come up with a parallel path that gives kids a, a way to learn the, in something they really like. I mean, kids love to play these sports and they put time and effort to it. We just want to give them a way to do uh, project-based learning with superstars and we've done it. And again, maybe I'll be more specific in my request of all you governors, but I went to Governor Sununu just before the uh, COVID and said for the first time in 30 years, Governor, we've lost the competitive. We're no longer the highest per capita in, in the country by state. There's a little Midwestern state that was having a lot of trouble with their the auto industry. And there, the leadership of their governor doubled down and said, I'm going to put first in every school in these bankrupt cities like Detroit. What happened? Those cities came back, their education came back, they are now places that are bringing kids from the suburbs because they all want to be on our great dynasty teams. They have the highest per capita involvement in, in first. So I went to our governor and said, we got to fix this. We're a little state. You only got about 100 high schools. The governor did what I asked him to do. You came up with governor, it was around a million bucks. And more importantly, you asked all the tech leaders in the state to get together at the state house. I said to the tech leaders, if we can give each high school in the state a couple of thousand bucks to get them enrolled, will you supply, that's the heavy lifting, that's the secret sauce, will you supply all the volunteers that nobody pays for, not the Department of Education, to come and work with the kids because it's so much fun. The tech companies swarm into it because the BAEs, they all need these kids. They all see this as their future. So they came in. And for about a million bucks, we got 88 new schools. We became the highest per capita again in the country. But all I could think of after that was, what if every governor went out and convened their tech leaders that are all desperate, like you need 36,000, but they need seven. What if each one of you governors convened the people in your state, but instead of them all saying, what, first one? 
they don't have to have explained to them football or basketball. It's a standard. Instead of asking everybody to come up with their own programs, that's really hard. All I'm asking you to do is something easy. Yep. All agree to come up to a standardized way to make the equivalent of the NCAA for a sport that actually matters. Get behind it, create some fun competitions between you, bring your industries together, and you will change the course of what happens to kids and industry in this country pretty damn quickly. It, that's a... Uh, there were two great answers there. Let me just add a little bit. Uh, you've got FIRST Robotics that uh, is, you know, it's movable. I mean, you can move into a lot of different new areas of technology through that. Uh, but you've also got industry that uh, will supplement, which is critical, uh, that they take a lead in supplementing what's happening in the schools through internships, apprenticeships, uh, because you know, we recruit teachers in Arkansas, and they might be a math teacher, it might be a French teacher, all of a sudden is teaching computer science and got the certification, but how do they keep up with blockchain technology and, and uh, the privacy issues and, uh, you know, security, cybersecurity? And so, it really, it takes that supplement that comes from industry, from FIRST Robotics, uh, in addition to what we can do in retraining and, and refreshing our teachers. Uh, great comments. Yes, Governor Doug. I want to, like Glenn, I want to start with gratitude. And uh, Asa, thanks for your leadership in driving this across the uh, the nation. And congrats on the success on your chairman's initiative. Uh, Dean, uh, you've been legendary on this going back for decades and uh, grateful that you're here again. Uh, you've come to so many of these meetings challenging all of us. And Pat, uh, a special shout out. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, I was part of a struggling software startup and uh, the 486 chip that you helped design from Intel uh, was a breakthrough for us, so thank you for that. Uh, uh, I think we all get it. Everybody signed up on computer education and great things are happening and there's some good challenges, but I want to bring something up to the governors, another challenge which has to do with the cybersecurity element of this. Uh, we, we know that uh, states uh, have lots of power over lots of things, but when it you know comes to national defense, we think, hey, that's the job of the federal government, but the states have all these other delegated rights. But we're in a spot right now where uh, foreign, you know, state actors are directly attacking states, school districts, and cities, uh, and whether that's a, a ma ransomware or whether that's uh, some other kind of attack that they're trying to do to be disruptive or disrupt national security. And as governors, uh, I think we all understand that we've got uh, a moral and a financial and legal obligation as governors. We're not like a credit card company where if we get hacked, you know, somebody's transactions get exposed. We've got health information because all of us are doing all of the Medicare, Medicaid, and all of that. We've got all the school information. We've got, uh, you know, criminal justice information. We've got financial and tax information. We really have got information about just about every aspect. I mean, down to fishing license, driving license, et cetera. And yet, when we talk about all these shortages of skills, one of the places where the biggest gaps is IT capability in state governments and in city government and in county government and the school district, the, the lack of IT. You talk about all these shortages of these jobs and then, and then many of you say, well, hey, well, if you can't find the jobs, we can just automate it with great cybersecurity tools. But then many of us haven't been able to successfully get legislators to drive the budgets to be able to do that. And so one of the things that we're trying to do in North Dakota, and we've been successful, is we've passed a, the first in the nation cyber education curriculum. And it wasn't just K through 12, we call it, we call it K20W. It's pre-K through K12, through college, through PhD, through workforce. Because when we talk about PhDs that are research universities, they're also under attack from foreign direct nationals with people trying to st steal IP. So we've got this thing integrated, and people may think at first it's odd. What, is, you know, what does a fourth grader need to know about cyber education? Well, the fourth grade teacher needs to understand it, and the fourth grade students do, because if they're getting an assignment where they're supposed to go on the internet to research a topic in, a, in elementary school, they need to know some of the basics. So it's, it's age-appropriate curriculum all the way through the whole thing. We've got that uh, adopted. And then, but you say, okay, well, that's nice. It's, you know, this is not a soundbite. I mean, I would just say one example, which has now been declassified, is that we had a small school district near the Canadian border where we've got nuclear missiles in North Dakota. Uh, the, the school district, who had no real IT people, called our state cybersecurity team, and they said, hey, our, our systems are running really slowly. 
uh, we said, sure, maybe we can help. We come up there. It turns out the North Koreans were in the school district. They were trying to get through the, 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 the system that had all the grades to get at the parents' emails addresses because the parents worked for the North Dakota National Guard and they were part of the security detail that does the ground security for the missile silos. So then you say, okay, well then, okay, we have a little school district with a couple hundred kids defending against a foreign national that's got people coming to work every day to try to attack us. And then you call the federal government and say, hey, could we get some help? And they're short of, of you know, tens of thousands of people working on cyber defense. So it's a new era. People, you know, people say, oh, you know, we've got a war going on in Europe right now. No, there's, it, there, that's war. We have cyber war going on every day, and every one of us at a state level is getting attacked. The awareness is low. The solutions aren't strong. Education is one component of it. But I think as governors, we need to stand together and really raise the awareness about this because as a nation, uh, we're vulnerable. Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, just one, one comment to make you feel better or for worse, right? But maybe an opportunity to actually rally efforts. Uh, we, we all remember what Y2K was, right? And we crossed that uh, you know, century threshold. Many of our systems needed to be upgraded. And it actually caused us to make the biggest upgrade in our cyber systems, right, in history, right? Because all of a sudden there was a moment in time which drove uh, energies for cyber upgrades, for upgrading many of our encryption and other standards associated with it. Well, we're about to have the next one, right? And we've called it Y2Q, right? Where sometime before 2030, we expect the first quantum supremacies to occur. What does that mean? The first quantum computers that are able to systemically produce substantially better results than digital computers do. Why do you care? It's gonna make many of the encryption technologies that were appropriate for the digital space are now going to be rendered ineffective against quantum techniques. So now we're having, sometime between now and 2030, we believe this quantum supremacy in the cyber domain occurs. So now, between now and 2030, you have a Y2K moment where you're going to have to make fundamental upgrades to all of your cyber systems, and it becomes this defining moment for everyone's infrastructure, everybody's agenda to say, oh, now we gotta look again. We have to look at all of our systems and make those upgrades. All of the 50 things that were always, you know, never made it to the top 10 list, right? This has to drift to the top 10 as we prepare. And it will be, you know, we are never done with cyber, right? Because every day, you know, we make the cyber better, right? You know, those same tools are being used by the cyber criminals. Right? And the cyber gets better, the cyber criminals get better. This is a never ending game and needs to be a perpetual part of every governor's agenda because as you say, you're, you, know, you are the sovereign protectors. And as everything becomes more digital, you're just gonna have more and more of that data of humanity in every aspect of every citizen everywhere. So you know, between now and 2030, Y2Q becomes that next agenda item that allows us to make fundamental introspection on our cyber uh, infrastructure and make the upgrades necessary for the long term. You heard it here, Y2Q, be ready for it. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Uh, real quick, Patrick, can you talk, uh, Lord knows I've been pretty critical of Washington for doing nothing, but I, I believe very strongly in this CHIPS Act. I mean, you need it. If you're not successful, my citizens and Tom's and Charlie's, we're, we're all suffering, right? So what is it? Why isn't that moving forward? If you say, yeah, we got to get on a congressional delegations, I'll be the first one to pick up the phone. What is the holdback? What am I going to hear on the other end as, as, as to why that's not moving? Yeah, so the Senate passed USICA, right, the first, the second quarter of last year. House created their Christmas tree version of the CHIPS Act called Competes. They went into conference process, which had 120 people on it, right? How do you have a conference with 100, you know, it just, you know, ended up being a bit of a, you know, a political uh, process at this point, you know, and they're now to the point where they're saying, you know, we either get House to pass USICA, we create a skinny version of USICA that doesn't have Republican or partisanship between Republican and Democrat views, or we just pull out chips by itself and get it voted upon and secured. So three different pathways to get this done. There's getting a lot of energy currently. You know, McConnell said, hey, I'm not gonna let that reconciliation stuff go forward, right? And I'm gonna not allow USICA to come to the floor, right, for vote on any of those if the Democrats are still pursuing it. So we're really caught in, I'll say, the political sausage making right now. 
And our agenda is very simple. Get chips passed. Any of these three pathways, we're fine with because the chips portion is essentially identical on those. So my request for every governor is call your senators. We need this done before the August recess. Call your House uh, uh, caucus. We need this done as well. We need a bill to come to the floor, both in the House and in the Senate, right, and uh, for it to be uh, voted upon before the August recess. Because if it doesn't, I and others will make decisions to build fabs. You know, the semiconductor industry, a $600 billion industry, it's gonna to double to about 1.1 trillion by the end of the decade. So I have about $500 billion of capacity to build. It'll get built somewhere. We get to decide if meaningful portions of that are gonna be on American soil or not. This is our supply chains. This is, we invented this industry. You know, every aspect of this was American bet. And we have 80% of it now in Asia. Right, you know, huge portions in Taiwan and geopolitically unstable places. You know, this is criminal if we allow this trend to occur, right? And uh, I was talking to Governor Ducey on the way in here. You know, the ice maker in his new refrigerator doesn't work because he's lacking a chip, right? Yeah, you know, hey, and in that Arizona, is a crisis, you need, you need ice think. maker, don't you? Right, yeah. <laughs> right. you know, everything in Arizona. needs yeah. chips. Right, you know, associated, you know, it's just so critical right now. And I am just, you know, amazed that we've not seen this come across the line since the Senate passed this over a year ago. Time to get this finished. I beg for your help. So Pat, you're saying that the skinny version of this should be where they ultimately land if they have to solve this, to like yes. literally strip out a lot of the other stuff that- Yeah, you know, the tariff stuff, the trade stuff, all of that can go away. Just get the chips and the ITC funding done. And there is okay. essentially no disagreement on that. Get that so. done. And, and Pat, if I can add to that, and I enjoyed our conversation very much this morning, um, and I've been going back and forth with Secretary Raimondo. Uh, she suggested last night to just pull chips out completely. So I think that's even less than the skinny version. Yeah. That's just chips. You seek us skinny, and just there's, chips. And there's agreement on that. And I mm -hmm. think if we can be behind that, then we can, we can battle on the other stuff later, let's get chips passed before the August recess. And if you're gonna call these people that you've been asked to call, I'll ask you for one tiny, tiny, tiny thing to add. <laughs> Wait a minute, we signed an MOU last year with the Semiconductor Industry Association. First did that. First has a commitment from every semiconductor manufacturer in the country because we said, if they give you $52 billion, it's gonna to go to the four or five states that need their $10 billion uh, fab operations. How are we gonna make sure all 50 states wanna do this? Well, what if all 50 states could get resources to build the workforce that he needs to operate them and the customers and the kids that are gonna write the code to use it? So in our agreement, they, yep. that industry, is coming up with all the mentors we need to give you in each one of your schools a way to have your first team come online. So when you go for the skinny down version, the skinny down version needs to remember that FIRST and the semiconductor industry are partners here yeah. and leave us in there. Fully aligned. All right. Uh, all right. This is uh, uh, perfect timing as we uh, run out of time, but uh, I want to assure uh, Pat and Dean both on this issue that uh, we have, I believe it's lunch and probably tomorrow, a governor's only session. And uh, Bill, I'd like to challenge the NGA staff to beef up on the, this legislation. And uh, let's see what we can do as an NGA uh, in this session to uh, drive Congress for completing this. So we... <laughs> and and, and this, this takes everybody together. So uh, Doug, I'm very concerned about your ice maker and we want it fixed. <laughs> but I'd love to have some uh, you know, offline conversations uh, to, as we prepare for some of our, our uh, governor's only session meetings on this. So we'll work on that, that's our pledge to you. Thank you all for uh, coming here today. Great message on both. Give them a round of applause for, as we're adjourned. Thank you, Governor. Hey, Pat, well done, well done. We'll work on it. Thank Dave. you.